Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Accepting My Facade question and answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Accepting My Facade. Recorded on the 5th of June, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, well, now we've come to a accepting my facade question and answer. So, where you go, guys? Uh, we've got our mic runners, have we? Yep, good on you. Thank you. If we start it with Miranda here, thank you. Keep your hand up, Miranda. People don't know you. Yes, um, picking up on what Graham said earlier that there's like layers. Mm -hmm. So, do you have like a set of facade for different topics, issues? And um, of course you do, but Miranda, if I can stop this whole, this question about all the different facades you have, I've said quite clearly that you have layers and you have <coughs> a broad spectrum of them. So I think I've covered the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you continue asking more questions about it is because you're still not focused on the emotions you require to accept it. So. So I'd pr probably prefer in this Q&A to address these emotions, you know, that, that you're going to need to work your way through to accept it rather than discuss more about it. I think we've said enough about the facades. We need to talk more about the attitudes we have towards it than actually what the facade is. Does that make sense? So can we focus on that? Um, so let's go across to... Sorry, Kate. Mental blank. It happens. <laughs> happens when you've got a fever sometimes. Okay. <laughs> um, so it was just with what we were talking about at the end of the last session. Do, you, do I need to stand? Yeah. Yep. Helpful for this. One. Yeah. Yep. Um, it was whether we're going to need to have an uh, awakening to sin about how we're treating ourselves before we can proceed, you know, ex this is part of accepting the facade? Yes, remember the denial techniques we use are not only about how we treat ourselves, but how we treat others. Mm. So, so remember I said yesterday <laughs> with, with our facade that, you know, we get poked with our facade all, all through the days, you know, the law of attraction is constantly at work poking our facade. And, and, and many times our response is like a, a violent reaction back, you know, whether it be verbally violent, angry or abusive or whatever. Um, so that's our attack of others about our facade. And then for many of you, you've also got in this terrible habit of attacking yourself. So somebody points out a truth to you about your facade and all of a sudden you're having a meltdown about, oh, this is terrible, I've got all that, oh, and then you get real angry and upset with yourself and so forth. So, so one is to do with lessons in love that you've not learnt about how you treat others, and one's to do with lessons in love that you've not learnt about how you treat yourself. So in accepting your facade, you're going to learn some quite major lessons in love, actually. Do you see that? One's going to be a major lesson in love about how you treat yourself that's out of harmony with love, and the other is going to be a major lesson in love about how you treat others when, when they poke your facade and what you do there. Mm. And you're going to learn some major lessons in love by actually coming to accept your facade. So it seems like we are going to release some childhood pain through that? Well, you're been? going to release uh, emotions related to, f initially, related to how you treat your self and how you treat others when something in yourself is exposed. So these are in particular emotions surrounding truth that you're actually going to be addressing, your attitude to truth. Remember your facade is about living in a lie. It lives lies, it loves the lie. In fact, it's doing the lie because, it's, because it supports you avoiding pain. And, and once you start allowing yourself to work your way through it, you'll start having awarenesses about truth that you've never had before. See, at this stage, many of you, when I start speaking the truth to you personally, there's this, you know, you're hiding all the time. You're trying to run away from it all the time. You're trying to avoid it all the time. You're trying to weasel out of it. You're trying to, you do all those techniques, you know, to get out of truth. 
Well, a person who's accepted their facade doesn't do that. In fact, they do almost the opposite. They want to know, what do you mean? What do you mean by this and that? And, and they don't argue with you about it. They are more sort of like looking at it, like uh, being open to seeing what's really going on. So, so in the process, you will learn to address a number of emotions that prevent you from being open to truth. Does that make sense? It does. I can't even imagine what that is, but that's because I haven't experienced that, it. That's going to be part of the experience. So would, could, would it be helpful to just pray to God about having that awakening to sin of yeah, how the, this facade... The acceptance of the facade is the awakening to sin. Oh, okay. It is the process of seeing the results of your sin. Because mm. remember, your facade is the results of your sin and also the generator, the engine that causes more of your sin. So, so you need to go through accepting your facade so that you can have an awakening to sin. You need to get to the point where you know, oh, there I go sinning again, there I go sinning again, there I go sinning again. And what caused me to do that? What caused me? Oh, I want my addiction met there. Oh, I want that person to think I'm a nice person there. Oh, that's what I want. You know, you start having this awareness of what, what you want, what your expectations of the world around you and your demands are, and what your expectations of yourself and your demands of yourself are, and you start seeing them as generating further pain and suffering for yourself. And so you start reversing that process by having an awakening to the truth of it. Now, at this stage, you might not have processed a lot of other emotions about the pain associated with it, but you've at least awakened to the truth of what you're doing. And it is a very... A traumatic process to get to accept your facade. Does that make sense? Mm. So, so it's something that Mary's been going through, haven't you, darling? Probably for the last sort of, probably till probably the last only a few months or six months or maybe <coughs> more ago, where she's now starting down to get to get to the global terror and starting to really settle with that emotion, and and so it may take you seven years mm. to get to. To, to actually deconstruct what all of the things that are going on and, and, being wa and wanting to see them. You get to a stage where you want to see them rather than going, I don't want to see it, I don't want to see it, I want to run away from there, I want to, I want to argue with you, I want to fight about it. I want, you know, all those things are all indications you've not yet accepted. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, you know, when you see me in a shopping centre, you want to run away. There's an indication. <laughs> yeah. Could I ask another question sure as well? Can. Like I, I can feel that I don't want to accept my facade. Yep. So when I have contemplated that in the past, yep. or even had some emotions of compassion start to arise for yourself, compassion for yourself. Yeah, yep. for myself. Yeah. Yep. Then there's just been a lot of fear with that. So is that? Is it because I don't want to accept, like when we don't want to accept the facade, is it because that just leaves us open to that global emotional terror? Is that's yeah. why we're so resistive because right. once we do, then we're just left with terror. Correct. Okay. Yeah, what will happen is you, if you start deconstructing a lot of this and particularly your attitudes to it, what will happen is the global terror will start poking its head through mm. and you'll start being able to actually feel it's there. Well, I'm scared now. Does that make sense? Yeah, it it does. Mm. And should we like try to just sit with when that happens? Because that happened from that happened for me, even though I haven't done the accepting the facade step. Yeah, yet. we'll talk about what to do in this place in the next two days okay. after these days. Yep. Yeah. So it can we can start to you start that feeling this. while we're still. Yeah, yeah. At the it's same like, time, accepting the facade. Remember, all of this is like a process. The more of your facade you take away, uh -huh. the more clearly you see everything under it. Does that make sense? So it's not like a. It's not like you go from dark to light in an instant. Mm. What happens is is that you take away one bit of it, take away another bit of it, and the more you take away as a step by step sort of a process the more is revealed underneath what, what is causing it. And, and also you start seeing bits of your pain as well. You start seeing, oh, I've got this false belief that's driving this facade. And I've got you know, this terror that's still there. I can feel that terror now. Every time I do something with my facade, a bit of terror pops up. 
remember the terror is a lot about how the world around you will react to the real you so mm. so when you're when you take away some of the facade there's more of an imperative inside of you developing to be the real you and the problem with that is that you've got a lot of terror about being the real you so the terror will start popping its head up right it'll start you start feeling terrified about being the real you without your facade. It's sort of almost, if you could have pictured it from a physical perspective, it's like standing up here in the middle of everything and then stripping off all your clothes and going, <laughs> you know, because that's what it's really like. Your facade's like all these covers that you put on yourself so that you don't see your own true nakedness. Does that make sense? Your own true state. Mm. Yeah. So it's not exactly like a linear process. Like I think Definitely not. Sometimes I'm trying to understand this like... But it seems like um, with these layers, it can be one to many too. Like there's all these things all, all around, like thousands of these, like all around our soul. Yes. But some of them, it seems like they have the same pain underneath, but yes. different facades or addictions of things. Because so. remember, our facade was taught by the flavour of how our parents taught us. So whatever their were their favourite go tos, mm. generally became our favourites or our repulsion uh, our rebellion or our favorite so if our parents love lying to their neighbors and after i was a child you got so angry about lying to your neighbor you know and you got so annoyed with your parents about doing it and they punished you so much about doing it it's highly likely you won't do the same thing but you'll be in their face in the neighbor oh, this is how i feel about you yeah you know like you, you'll go the opposite direction because all that rage is still generating the generating the desire so your rage is generating desire to be truthful but it's still a facade because you're not really it's not your real self your real self doesn't feel that way you know your real self in fact is undeveloped you don't even know what you feel mm. does that make sense so you'll either be in rebellion to your parents facade and usually what happens is we're in rebellion to bits of their facade that we didn't like mm. and we accept the other bits of their facade that that we did like does that make sense and, and then we do that during the development of our own facades thereafter. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. No worries. Um, if we have Eloisa, thanks. And then Rachel in front of her, thanks. <coughs> um, it's feeling a bit excited about the fact that all of those techniques we use That's a way to recognise them in facade. Spot on. Isn't it? Of course. So every time I do those... So I every time know. you deny, you're in your facade. Yeah, you're lying, right? Every Denial is a lie, really, isn't it? Yeah. The yep. facade loves the lie, doesn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, you're in your facade. Every time you minimise, you're just covering over something. You're in your facade. Yep. Every time you justify, you're justifying why something, why you should do something that's wrong. You're in your facade. This is the kind of things the facade does. But also, you can pinpoint what your facade is about on that issue if you recognise. Yeah, this is why it's so good because you can actually start pinpointing some false beliefs you have, yes. and therefore what pain might be under it as well. Yes. So, as I say, you start releasing the emotions that govern your denial of your facade. Then you start seeing your facade. The beauty of seeing your facade is you start seeing what's under it, what's generating it, what's motivating it. And it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. Yeah. It's like the dawning of a day, you know, when, you, when it's just that real dark, it's really dark, and then slowly you start seeing the outline of something. And then, more, then as, that, as your outline starts appearing, you start to see a little bit of colour. And then eventually, in the full bloom of day, you see everything, right? And it's the same process with accepting your facade. You start off by deconstructing one or two of the emotions that cause you to shut down or deny your facade. And as you start picking them off one at a time, your facade comes clearer, 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 clearer. And you, and, and you start seeing it in, in, in you could say, panoramic, colourful detail. <laughs> <laughs> you follow? Yep. And, and in the, the beauty of doing that is you not only see the detail of your facade, but you start seeing what's below it as yeah. well. What terror is driving me here? What fear is driving me there? And, and it's quite interesting <coughs> because you, you're starting to discover 
all of these different things about yourself that you didn't know before. Yes. Right? So it's actually, uh, you can actually treat it as a voyage of discovery. You see, if you don't have so much condemnation of it, yeah. and, uh, and you have compassion for it, it's like a voyage of discovery of oneself. Can you see? Now that, that can be a joyous thing. Or it can be the terrible thing you've made it to be. <laughs> yeah. Do you see? Yeah. It can be a joyous... Like I, I've only ever received benefits from discovering more about myself that's out of harmony with love. I've only ever received a benefit. See, this is where faith is important, right? Getting to the stage where you actually believe it's going to benefit you. That we're seeing things in colourful detail is a lot better than not seeing anything at all. Yeah. Is not is a lot better than complete darkness. Yeah. And it's also a lot better than, you know, just seeing a hazy outline. Right? So so you're far better off going through the process and getting to the stage where you know, you have compassion for how it is because compassion allows you to see more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've been squashing their compassion. Yep, most yeah. have. Yeah. You know, it's like when the more we point out sin to you, the more there is a tendency to judge yourself for the sin. Yeah. Right? And this but is even not, that not, <coughs> not the thing to do. But go on. I was going to say, even that's just putting up a facade so that you don't, ha for yourself, just to not feel how much pain there is when that thing's pointed out. Anyway. Not only that, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of like a rock you throw at the person, at another person as well. You judge yourself or you judge others. Yeah. Either way, it, it shuts down the awareness. Do you see? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, when I'm pointing out a sin to you about your personal sin, I don't feel judgment of you. I don't feel like, uh, you know, m for most of you, you, you're not yet compassionate enough to see how that got created. Yeah. Now, a person who loves you will be compassionate with you about how it got created. Yeah. Right? So they're not going, you do this and you do that and you're a slimy bastard and you're gonna get, you know, I'm going to punish you and I'm going to get you and you're an evil thing. And, and they're not doing all that to you. A person who doesn't love you does that. Yeah. A person who doesn't love you manipulates you like that. But a person who loves you, you go, no, no, this is your stuff. This is what's going on. Like, I don't have to put up with that from you. you know, still, they can still have boundaries. But they just don't, they don't get into you and pull down your worth. Right? And remember we said in the very first group, there is a need for us to stop connecting truth and worth. Bang. You know, we still keep doing that where somebody tells us the truth and we think that means that they think we're not very nice. It doesn't necessarily mean that. No, of course, in the world it does. You know, they tell us the truth primarily to destroy us, right? But, but a person who loves you doesn't tell you the truth to destroy you. They tell you the truth to help you, and you can feel that from them. Yeah. That they're trying to do that to help you. I suppose the problem that when you do the other technique of trying to destroy, like exactly what you said, but you do it to yourself... That's the thing that I'm noticing for me is really hard. So I've got to then stop doing that to me too because I know, you know. Yeah, what I've learned is this. The more you do these destructive things to yourself, the more you think everybody else in the world is going to do you the same thing. Right? So what I've learned is that you can't really like feel another person's love while you're believing that they're unloving without oh. feeling whether they're loving or not. Right? Remember yesterday I talked to Graham about cynicism? Yes. Right? And remember I was pointing out to Graham, and this is just an example, I was pointing out to Graham how he, he sees cynicism as a way of life almost, like a, it's a way to handle everything. Yeah. You follow? Yeah. Now, now if, if anybody says anything to him, there's an automatic cynicism that arises when it's in disharmony with his own belief system. Yep. Right? What I'm suggesting to you, these automatic systems that arise, um, they colour our perception of the other person's attitude towards us. Do you follow? So with me feeling like very attacking of myself, I also fear and feel that everyone else underneath it is probably going to attack me too yeah. at some point. That's right. And then when I'm with you, how yeah. do you feel? I just feel real sad because you're real nice. Yeah. And you treat me really nice. Yeah. And you have far and more it, compassion. And even if I'm pointing out something to you, 
I don't ever feel like you're hurting me or want to or that you've ever got anger towards me, ever. And so what happens as soon as you remember that is you start crying. Yeah. So there's <laughs> the contrast, you see, of the contrast of what you're expecting from people. Yeah, and what love would do. And what love would do. You follow? Yeah. Yeah. And this is where I feel a lot of people, you know, this is where we need to do some work with, with these kind of emotions, you know, all these denial techniques we use. Those emotions prevent us from seeing and being able to measure even the real truth about whether someone is trying to help us or someone is trying to harm us. Yes. So the reality is if you try to harm me by telling me something about myself that you think is right, whether it's right or not, I'm not going to listen to you. Because, because if your desire is to harm me, then listening to you is just like going to be result in my further attack. Yeah. Do you follow me? Yes. Whether you're right or not, it's immaterial. If your desire is to harm me, to take power over me, to have control of me, to, to do any of these things, yeah. then it's out of harmony with love and so therefore I shouldn't listen. But if a person is, is demonstrating a desire to love you, a desire to help you, a desire to assist you to progress and grow, and they're telling you a truth, then obviously it would be wise to accept it yeah. and to analyse and to let yourself listen to it, right? Yeah. But, that, but with these, a lot of these emotions, we're not going to do that automatically. Yeah. We're going to automatically knee-jerk responses to people telling me truth. Yeah. So remember I said to Kate that the facade is all about lies and therefore a lot of deconstruction of the facade, facade you will learn about truth, how good it is, how powerful it is, how wonderful it is to know and how colourful it makes everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So and it's great. pretty hard when you don't have that because yeah. everything else feels real bad. Yeah. 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 Thank you. No worries. Um, we were down at Rachel next, and on this side, if we go to Luli. Thanks. Um, my question's about the refusal of terror. Yes. Which is our motivator for our facade. Yeah. Yep. I'm trying to connect with my question again. It's more about. I think I've lost it. Um, it is, yeah, I think I've lost it. <laughs> That's all right. If you put up your hand again, if you remember it, yeah. and I'll come back to you. Uh, if we come down to Luli. Um, I was wondering if you could give us some ideas of how, <clears throat> how we can build faith in this process when we're so resistive to feeling emotions, but you kind of have to deal with the emotions to work through, you know, these nasty feelings we have about the facade. Yep. So some, yeah, ways to build faith. I, I feel um, many of you are trying to build faith in yourselves. Is that not true? And I feel you need to build faith in God rather than yourselves. Like, I've not had too much faith in myself. It's, some, myself. it's something I've had to grow, you know. And, but that didn't stop me from doing it because I had some faith in God and God's goodness and and how God created me and that God wants me to know the truth and God wants me to understand the truth about myself and God wants, to, wants me to know when I'm lying to myself and God wants me to know when I'm lying to others. So I feel the biggest aspiration to develop with regard to faith is to look more honestly at God. And this is why right back in our first group, the very first presentation was about how we felt about love and in the end it got to be really how we feel about God was about how we felt about parents, right? And we haven't deconstructed that enough to have some faith and trust that God is different. And we haven't separated our God from our parents. We place God and parents in a similar authority vein. And this is a very important thing to do with your faith, I feel. So once you develop faith and have an aspiration to develop faith, though, learn more about God, God's nature, God's goodness. Be honest about that to yourself. Rather than telling yourself lies about it, be honest about God that God must be good and, and those kind of things. Then there's a higher likelihood that you'll start allowing yourself to go through a process that God designed without you resisting that process. Do you follow? You've got to have faith in something other than yourself. Because the reality is, if you look at your facade, it's not very faith-inspiring, is it? No. And and to me, you've got to have faith in you've got to have faith in God. And not I'm not saying that you would create an imaginary God. 
it has to be faith in the real thing. But I'm saying that you need to have faith in God, that God designed this particular process for you, and, and that it's all in harmony with God's laws, all, all which surround truth, actual truth. So obviously the facade being a lie is in opposition to God's truth. Uh, and it's in fact the main reason why most of you oppose God's truth at this point. Now remember our, the point of our whole discussion this week is about becoming my loving self and the reason why we're trying to do that is so that we can stop opposing the flow of God's emotion into us and the flow of God's truth into us. So if our facade is our main opposer, then obviously our facade is something we have to address. Now, my feelings are, have some faith that God is good and God is leading you down this track and all of God's laws are. And if you don't have faith, develop an aspiration to measure whether you should, you know, measure this if this is God is good. To measure what, how God treats you when you expose something in comparison to how your family treat you. Rather than thinking that how your family treat you is how God will treat you. Do you follow me? Yes, I reflect on these things, but they don't sink in and stay with me. You know, I, I logically try and go, well, God, you know, look at my, the human body, look at a, a loving parent wouldn't create a system where we're not able to become happy in that system. But it, Yeah, what I find, though, is if, if we reflect on them, but it doesn't transfer to action, it's usually because we're refusing to act, and we refuse to act. Why? Of fear, because we're afraid, and so we're honouring fear, and and so so a lot of it does get in the end back down to being willing to feel this, doesn't it? Can you see that? So when it comes yeah. to we haven't yet discussed the deconstruction of our facade. What we're discussing at this point is the acceptance of our facade. Do you follow? Yep. And I feel that all of you can easily develop an aspiration to accept your facade even if you have no desire to deconstruct it. But I, I, I assure you that by the time you've accepted all of your facade in its nice, colourful detail and glory, you'll probably want to have to do something, want to do something about it. Right? So I'm suggesting to you, Luli, that what you're trying to do is you're trying to sort of skip to the next step without first accepting how it is. And the more you try to do that, the more frustrating this process is going to become for you. Okay. Does that make sense? And that requires emotionally accepting how it is and then developing the aspiration to feel the emotions associated with how it is, which you haven't had the aspiration to feel. You've had the aspiration to feel these, hoping that once you get to there, everything's done, I'll be done and dusted. Do you see what I'm saying? Without, without, it's sort of like you've had the aspiration to ignore the monster and get on with life and address the real or, cause. Or try and make the monster go away so I don't have to deal with the fact Yeah, you're trying to rub out the monster, <laughs> right, without, without going through the emotional process required to rub it out. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you go straight behind to Kerry. Um. Is it possible while you're working through accepting your facade and through those emotions that you can receive God's love to help with that process? You'll receive God's help if you have a sincere desire to receive it. And, uh, but it's highly unlikely at this stage you're going to receive very much of God's love. Why? Because you're in your facade. And what's the facade? Not your real self. Not your real self. And also it's in a lie, yeah. and unless you have a willingness to deconstruct all that, then it's highly unlikely you receive a lot of God's love. This is why it's such a difficult time, because it's a time when you're confronting all of these systems that are really hard inside of you, while at the same time not receiving much love or confirmation that it's working. But if you had, if God could feel that you were sincere about wanting to accept your facade and work through all those emotions, mm -hmm. would then... Would you then receive, and you longed for God's love, mm -hmm. would you then receive God's love? Of course you'll receive some. Yeah. Yeah. But sooner or later those, the facade's going to get triggered and then we'll really see whether you're sincere. Yeah. 
And the reality is most of us aren't at the beginning. Yeah. So this is why at the beginning you hear about divine truth. You might have a few really sincere prayers and receive a little bit of God's love. And then you go longer and longer and longer without receiving any. And the reason why that happens is because you're still not addressing what God wants you to address. And that is the fact that you've got a huge amount of internal opposition to God's truth and internal opposition to God's love through the operation of the terror driving your facade. To actually receive God's love, you've got to release pain. And most of us are adepts at denying pain rather than releasing it. Yeah. Remember, the pain causes our false beliefs. It's our, it's our false beliefs that prevent us from being in a love state relationship, right? A love relationship with God. So, in the end, you're going to have to get down to it. Now, what I see most of you now doing is you're asking questions. To me, they are. Um, what's the best way of putting it? No, no, they're not. It's not addiction. It's it's an an. It's a desire to avoid your terror of doing it. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. You're afraid of doing it. And, and, and you are afraid of doing it because you've been taught ever since day you were born or even before then, you had expectations placed on you. Usually most of you even had expectations placed on you before you were born. You know, some of you, they wanted to be, a, you know, your dad wanted to be a boy rather than a girl. Some of you... You know, the opposite to that. Some of you, they expected that you'd be an intelligent person who does a whole lot of special things and it hasn't turned out that way. And do you know what I mean? There's a whole lot of expectations that were placed upon you before you were even born. And then, you know, there's obviously ones placed on you afterwards. So, so there's obviously a huge amount of, you know, creation of this facade has been imposed upon by society and by parents. And we have a deep amount of terror about being our real self here. And, and, that, and that is a problem. So, so later we're going to see that there's a couple of ways we can address this. We can obviously spend all of our time up here, right, deconstructing all this without trying to address this. Or we can do both, can't we? Now, one's going to work and the other one's not. We can, disrupt, we can deconstruct all of this but still refuse to feel that. And if we refuse, refuse to feel that, and I'm now pointing to the global fear of terror, the feeling of terror, if we refuse to feel terror and we refuse to go through that emotionally, then, then of course we're just going to be motivated to create another facade. And this is what many of you have done since meeting me. You're different people now or you act differently now than you did before, but you basically substantially haven't changed. You've just created another facade, thinking that this is the way that you, the way of God's truth. And it's not. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. The way of God's truth is to come face to face with everything that's going on, and the underlying, you know, fear that drives it. Mm. Eventually, you're going to get to this, and you're going to have to process it. And if you don't process it, the majority of you who don't process it will not hear divine truth anymore. Like at the moment, it's probably been. Probably a couple of hundred thousand people that have heard divine truth. There's 4,000 people around about who currently listen. Of those 4,000 people, very few have actually gone through accepting their facade. Very few. Count them on probably two hands. And, and I don't even know if it's one hand, to be frank. And, and as a result, every time you hear truth, there's a, no, don't tell me more, don't tell me more, I've had enough now, I can't cope with more, that's it. You shut down, you run away. You reason with me about how you're doing well here and you're doing well there and you want me to agree. And it's all, it's all just avoidance of what's really going on, right? And, and wanting me to feed some addiction so that you don't have to feel how bad it is. The state of facade is bad. Uh, I know it's bad. If you don't know it's bad yet, you haven't accepted it yet. Once you accept it, you know it's bad. Like when I, when I look, at, look at what mine was, I go, this is pretty bad. And pretty bad for me as well as others. Pretty bad. And, and I had to get to the stage where I accepted it with compassion, where I got to the point where I felt like I had compassion for the fact that I got created. It wasn't my doing. And particularly at the beginning, it certainly was not my doing. And in my case, I created very little facades other than the ones my parents demanded of me. So, so 
So I didn't have a different facade at work and I didn't have, didn't have a different facade at school and I didn't have a different facade. I had basically one or two primary facades because, I, because I've always had a love for truth, you see. So I only had one or two primary facades that were created in my childhood when I didn't have a formulated mind to address the issue. And as a result, it was relatively easy for me to get rid of my facade in comparison to most. Yeah. Right? But... But I've had more difficulties with pain than you're ever going to have. All the 14 of going have far greater difficulties with pain because of the extent of it than any other person on the planet will have. But, but it still doesn't take away the fact that you need to address the terror that, you, that suppresses this pain. So what I'm suggesting to you, Ke Kel, is that, Kerry, is that unless you do both... Unless you get through this facade, deconstruct it, and start touching this, your motivation for creating the facade will not change. Mm. Your motivation, you need to understand the motivation for the facade as well as understand the state of it. Yeah. Yeah. And remember in the previous talk, we talked about the two primary motivations, the desensitisation to pain and the avoidance of the feeling of terror. Mm. They're the two primary motivations and unless you address those motivations in the end, your facade will continue to get generated, yep. no matter what you do. Thank you. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many you have. <laughs> it doesn't matter how bad they are or how devious they are or how, how straightforward they are. At the end of the day, unless you deal with that, you still won't get beyond it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. If you go straight behind, uh, Lani. Um. Can you um, just speak about the difference between fear and the global terror? Like I, I can't really understand. Yeah, um, I, I was very uncertain about using the word global for a start because we're talking about an internal emotion, not, not something <laughs> to do in the world so much. And it's an emotion inside of you that pervades everything you do. So basically, when we refer to global emotions, as we'll discuss later in our course, um, you're ba we're basically discussing that an emotion that affects everything. So you could say faith is a global emotion. It affects everything you do. Once you have some, it affects everything you do. It's a positive global emotion. And negative global emotion is terror. It affects everything you do. While it's in you, it's going to affect everything you do. Yes. Does that make sense? It, it really does, because before I was thinking of global as everyone on the planet. Well, it's true. Everyone on the planet <laughs> does have it. But, but oh. we're talking here about an emotion inside of yourself that affects every other thing that you do, say, think, feel. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. That's yes, what we're primarily... Now, I couldn't come up with a word, a single word, that easily described that. And so I left it to the course to describe it to you. And, and um, that's what we're talking about when we speak of global emotion. And there are positive global emotions and negative ones, as you'll find out in, in two days' time. And, and what we need to do is see that terror is a negative, in the sense that it affects us negatively, global emotion. It is the driving force for every choice we make, usually. Every choice. So is, is terror underneath fear? Well, no. Remember, false beliefs and false definitions of loves create fear. So a lot of your fears are under the terror. You understand? A lot of your fears are actually underneath the terror. The terror is like a global cover over all of your fears. So can you give an example of like what a global terror would be? Well, I have already. I've said to you it is the terror of you being yourself. Mm. Now that covers over many of your fears. So, so you're afraid to get up in front of people and speak, mm. right? You're okay sitting in the chair, but getting up in front of people and speaking for an hour would stress you out, right? Yeah. You're afraid of that. Now, that's an individual fear. But your global terror says, I'm afraid of being myself. So whenever I'm afraid of being myself, I will have lots and lots and lots of things that I do, all driven by that one terror <laughs> of being afraid of being myself. Right? Lots of things, hundreds of things, thousands of things sometimes that I'll do to avoid just being me. So that, um, the real self, would that be like 
as a, a, a very, very, very small child, when you had that sense of freedom and... Is yeah, most of us have uh, had very few cognizant experiences of our real self. Oh. Because we were taught from a very young age that your real self was unacceptable to the environment in which you lived. You had to conform. That's the point of your facade. Conform, conform, conform to other people's viewpoint of what you should be. Mm. So, so your global terror is a lot about your real self. And we'll talk about that you know, in four <laughs> days. Because we remember we've got more material to give you yet. <laughs> yep. Okay, let's go to um, Alan. Thank you. And then David on this side. AJ, if you're younger, presumably your facade is like, you know, if you're 20 or something, it's a lot less than when you're older? Well, I don't know. I've seen some people in their 20s with very intense facades. So you know, I think a lot depends on what happened to you and the intensity of your childhood experience, the intensity of your parents' emotions, the intensity of the opposition to you being yourself. You know, there's a lot of factors that are involved in it. Obviously, ge uh, speaking in generalities, the younger you are, the less you've created facades as an adult. But, but I don't think you can just say if a person's younger, they have less facade, because I've seen some people who are very young have some pretty intense facades. Because okay, yeah. that was the other part of my question is that just, just some people have much more terror and, and pain and fear than others. Obviously, yeah. because everyone's had a personal experience. But everyone has the primary terrors associated with being themselves and in particular terrors about their relationship with God. Most people don't trust God at all. Mm -hmm. And so then they become self-reliant. Most people have that. That is a general society-based terror. So, so some of them are going to be more intense than others. Like if you were brought up and beaten senseless as a child for a lot of your childhood, obviously you're going to have a lot of terror of violence and you're going to be so afraid for your life. But, but for many of you, you are afraid of your life and that didn't happen to you. So where did that come from? Well, obviously from generations handed down, the emotion not released by the parents, the, the sin of the parent getting transferred to the child through the gestation process um, before the child's even born. So many of you have terrors that you've got no idea even got there, how they got there. You don't have to know how they got there. You don't have to know what they are. All you need to do is feel the terror. Right. And this is what I see most of you trying to do. You're trying to go, what's this about? Why have I got this? Where did it come from? You're trying to understand it before you feel it. This is our problem. We're trying to understand everything before we feel it. Global terror, global problem. Do you see? It's a big problem, this uh, desire to understand everything before you feel anything. You are only going to understand when you have felt. That's the only time you're going to understand. Right? So many of us want to do all the understanding before we feel. You're not going to. And, you, and it's impossible to, in fact. Because the very feeling that you have prevents the understanding. So unless you feel the feeling, you won't understand. Uh, so I've given up the desire to understand. I went through a lot of torture-based experiences that I had in the first century life. In this life, I, had to re I remembered them and had to go through them again. And when I went through them, I had no concept what caused them. I didn't know who I was at the time. I didn't know what they were. I, can just, rem I just remembered people nailing stuff into me and, and, and other events as well. Uh, with dogs and getting eaten by a dog and, and being speared through the hip with a burning spear and um, a lot of other events I went through feeling them without understanding anything about them and interestingly enough there was no evidence on my body <coughs> see with you there'll be some if there were actual events but it mean no evidence on my body that any of those events actually occurred and, it, and yet I still had enough trust in God and the process to actually feel the emotions associated with those events without even knowing what they're about. And for many of those events, I didn't know till seven years after I processed the emotion what those events were about. So hanging up on what you think they are is a real block. Yes. In fact, you've got to give up what you think they are. Most of you are going to be wrong. 
in effect, the facade wants you to be wrong so that you don't process it. <coughs> See, that's why you've got to give it up because <laughs> the facade wants you to be wrong about it. The facade wants you to go, you might be wrong so you can't feel it until you know what it's about. That's what the facade wants you to do. It, it, it's the thing that's going, you're going to go crazy if you feel things you don't know what they're about. The facade does all that for you. None of it's true. You're going to go crazy if you don't do it. And there's plenty of evidence of that. How many people in adult in their in their aged life get dementia? Right? There's a growing proportion. It's like becoming an epidemic now. Right? Particularly in Western society. It's becoming an epidemic. Why is it becoming an epidemic? Because the majority of us don't want to remember. We don't want to go through the feelings. And as a result, we're shutting down more and more and more and more feelings to such a point that we can't even be cognizant anymore about who we even are. That's how you go crazy. The way you don't go crazy is by giving up having to know what the feeling's about and just processing the feeling, letting yourself feel the feeling. And that's what happened with Mary when you used to tell her what the emotion was. It didn't. Sorry? It didn't help one little bit that you told Mary what the no, emotion was. So not at all, did it, darling? Yeah. Did it help you at all being told what an emotion was before you knew it uh, yourself? Not in the beginning. It does now, though, sometimes. Well, it does now because Mary's accepted her facade so she can now not block what's uh, going on and therefore yes. can feel <laughs> the emotion. But right at the beginning, it, it didn't help at all. In fact, you felt more... Well, it built more facade, really, because yeah, I then tried to not be like that yeah. without acknowledging that I was like that, yeah. and then I just it got very complex and yeah. tiring. And, and often angry and bitter. Very and angry, and yeah. then just get further and further away from where you need to be going, which yeah. is towards the fear and the truth. Yeah, and, and Mary and I have had long conversations about what's going on for Mary. And in the end, we, we, I've just said it to Mary, look, I don't want to talk to you anymore about what you want to ask. <laughs> because, because what Mary was doing was asking me so that she could avoid feeling it. right? And I'm saying, no, you've just got to choose to feel it. And the best thing you can do is to work out why you don't want to feel it. Instead of asking everything about it. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, wanting to know things in advance here avoid, is avoiding the process of actually feeling what is already there that you can actually feel. Yeah. I found that it was actually my fear driving the desire. process, the desire to know. And, yeah. uh, and then, I, so I stopped and then I felt afraid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Mary's finding she's going through this much easier now because she's not asking all the time in order to prevent of terror. Does that make sense? It makes sense, doesn't it? So all we've got to do is give up some things. It's a lot, you know, ironically, it's a lot simpler. And, and while I've described all of these things, the reason why I'm describing it to you is so you can have compassion. See, we, we still haven't had many questions about compassion. You notice that? And, and the reason why is because, because we don't have compassion. Yeah. All right. Um, who are we? I'm David. So. Um, when feeling through the um, our attitudes to our facade, yep. If we've got more of a childhood facade that we judge, say, of it being really weak, that facade was really weak. Yep. Do we then go into feeling about how weak we actually felt? during that period of our life kind of thing? Is that how we challenge that facade and the judgment of it? Yeah, you've got to surrender to each emotion, David. So if there is an emotion inside of you feeling weak, then just surrender to it and just feel weak, you know? Mm. The key to each emotional process is to just allow yourself to surrender to it. It's, it's quite a simple thing. Of course, the fear prevents, us, prevents surrender. It's like a global cover over surrender, real surrender, yeah. So obviously when you do surrender, you, you, initially it's going to be hard because you always will hit the fear. Until you get through the fear, you'll always just hit the fear before you actually finish up surrendering to the actual emotion. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Yeah. And you, the fear, is going through fear, we'll talk about that later too, but going through fear is actually, it's going to look pretty bad. The world around you is going to judge it. 
It's going to look pretty bad to you even. You'll, you'll, you'll be scared of it. You'll, you'll freak out about the process. You'll be quite worried about and concerned about your own sanity. You'll be concerned about your psychological state. You'll be, you know, there's all sorts of things in that place that you'll go through just working your way through it, right? And, and it has to be done before you're really going to feel any pain-based emotion in the end. So, so you can't circumnavigate it, the fear. You'll find you'll, you, once you start letting yourself go through it, there'll be times when you start feeling another emotion and then all of a sudden you come up against the fear again. Start feeling another emotion and then you come up against the fear again. And then after a while of doing that, you know, in some cases for you, some of you it's going to take years of doing that before you go, oh, I've just got to feel this fear and develop a will to feel the fear. So my fear of the emotion is, is more the block around my facade than actually the feeling of weakness. Yes, you can see the facade is just what you do to avoid your fear of emotion. Mm. So, so this is the real block. Mm. This is just the, mo the monster you've created to avoid the block. Yeah. You see? Yep. So you do need to deconstruct the monster but because the monster helps you avoid the block. The addictions help you avoid the block. And so forth. So you do need to de deconstruct it. But at the end of the day, the point of the deconstruction is not for itself, but rather to get to this and to feel it as a feeling. That's the point of it. Get to that point. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Pleasure. Okay. Um, okay. If we go to Patty over here, thanks. <coughs> so. Accepting facade feels radically new to me, mm -hmm. um, and the, even saying the word compassion brings tears to my eyes. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> is that because this is a reflection of God's definition of love, and it's contrasting to the world's definition of love? Yes. So when it's not actually feeling God's love, but it's just feeling some flavor of it. Or yeah, well, what will happen when you start having compassion for your facade is you, you'll get a lot more assistance from your celestial friends. You'll get a lot more love from them as well because you, you're able, they, they're wanting to help you go through this process of getting through. the. You, they want you to have the awakening to sin that you need to have, right? And they know through their personal experience what they've needed to do to do that. And a lot of it's about this, like accepting the facade and getting to the point where emotionally I go, yeah, this is how I am right now. And, and they know that. And so whenever you even have compassion for yourself feeling that, they're going to be in agreement with it. God's going to be in agreement with it. So there's, you will receive some love in that point if you long for it, certainly, because you're in agreement with what needs to be done from mm -hmm. God's perspective and from their perspective. So you will receive their love and God's. And quite often that you'll be overwhelmed by that even. But many of you don't even allow yourself to be overwhelmed. And why? Because you are terrified of being overwhelmed. <laughs> so even that will get to the point where you get afraid of that emotion. You see what I'm saying? You, this is what I'm saying. With this emotion, you're going to hit it so many times if you're real sincere about this process. You're going to hit this emotion so many times before you actually have a sincere desire to actually feel that emotion. You're going to hit it a lot. Mm -hmm. You start feeling an emotion, start crying, and then you get freaked out and, and you shut it all down. And kicks the There it is, kicking it again. Into high gear, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're going to get to that stage over and over and over again before you realise that actually... This is what Jesus has been talking to you about, this global experience of terror that I'm going to have to go through at some point. And at this stage, I don't have my will developed to go through it, so I need to develop my will to go through it. Once you've developed your will to go through it, you will go through it. You, you, it'll be a natural process. Does that make sense? But, but it's only once you have. Until then, you're going to be fighting it all the time. You, every time you hit to it, you go, oh, I want to run away again, I want to, want to run again. And, and, and this, will, this will be a growing state within you. If, if you're sincere, it may take you even just a few years to, from touching it the first time to actually dealing with it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. it took me three years, like I said, between those two places. Touching it and then actually dealing with it where I went through the experience emotionally okay. of dealing with it. 
Yeah. So don't be surprised if it takes you a similar amount of time. Yeah. It's wonderful, the growing awareness. Um, if we come across next to Susan, thanks. I'm not sure that I've put this together yet, but I have this feeling, and maybe it's obvious, that it's the terror from getting into trouble in my childhood that caused me to be hypersensitive to the positives and negatives of of even the words involved in this, like corrupt and sin. Mm -hmm. And I find when I first read them that I just... I'm almost, freak out. Yeah, I freak out. Yeah. And I read them and I read That's them. That's why I use them. the words. Yeah, because it touches, it gets you in touch with Well, the I use the words for two reasons. They are the truth, right. number one. And when I use them, it also touches a point inside of you of feeling like, that. you know, even that word feels confronting to me to consider, right? Remember, like I said to the previous group, remember the very first time I used the word God with you? Most of you were freaked out, eh? You were, you thought you were coming to some religious thing above and... We, you know, for, as your definition of religion, and many of you came from New Age circles, which already had a lot of anger towards religion, right? And when some fella you come along to see, you know, I don't know what know what you expected at that time, considering the fact that I was saying I was Jesus. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know that I must know God if that's the case. And but but most of you are freaking out about that, and so even the word God was like, "Do not say that word to me," right? It's exactly the same with many of the other words I wanted to use with you, like sin. For most of you, when I say that word, it's like, do not use that word for me. Sin connotates judgment for the majority of you, right? So, you know, you feel you're being judged as soon as, you, as, soon as we mention sin. So, so it's the same with a lot of the words I'm using now in these, in these presentations. They are there to help confront the emotions that exist and expose within you the fact that these emotions do exist. It, it almost feels like we were conditioned to have judgment about the words and the very judgment about the words created the facade. Yeah, it's more that the judgment about the words is about more of the other judgments that have occurred and you know, it's more the other way around. The emotion of pain causes judgment in the end. Preventing the emotion of pain. Okay, it's like at a feeling level. Yeah. More than that. Yeah. yeah. And the intellect, remember the intellect is just responding to the demands of the soul. So if the intellect the intellect's just going, do what you think is the logical thing so that I can avoid these things. Yeah. And the intellect's going to do what it needs to do, mm. just in response. Natural. Mm. Yeah. And we have to deconstruct that process, but but for most of us we don't. So we're going around using our intellect, thinking we're being logical, like I said, when actually we're being so illogical. You know, if I say the words blasphemy, now for most of you that's a pretty strong word, right? And most of it has religious connotations. But the reality is you blaspheme God most of the day. right? But see, you've got so much judgment about that word that when you hear that word, it's like, oh, here we go, I'm getting condemned again. I'm getting judged again. No, we're just saying a truth. The word blaspheme means something in the English language and we're using it to demonstrate what it means. So same with, with other words, corrupt. The word corrupt means something in the English language and we need to state it. Does it make sense? For what it is. Use it when we need to use it. It has no emotional connotation except for the emotions you give it, Inside me. Yeah. which come from your avoidance of pain and your false beliefs and your false definitions of love that are now in you emotionally. Mm. I, uh, for myself, it's just the terror of getting into trouble. If you trouble. hold the mic close. Oh, yeah, it's just the terror of getting into trouble. Yeah, yeah well, the, the terror of getting into trouble is really, though, a terror about being yourself, isn't it? So there's, there's terrors under that. Right. So I'd call it a fear of getting into trouble, mm -hmm. but but there's bigger terrors that are above underneath that. <laughs> Thank you. So that's great and encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> All right, now I'm way over time by 20 minutes, guys. So we're going to have to leave our Q and A there, otherwise you won't. We won't get through the day on time. So. 
um, and we're already over time. So if we leave our Q&A there and we have a, it's a 30 minute break, so that means you, everyone comes back at two o'clock and we can discuss, uh, uh, we can do the feedback sessions then.